I guess uh, what really interested me was that you're kind of voyaging in a, a new way. Uh, seems like a mix of, of sort of kayaking and, and offshore cruising that are both really popular, but I, I think you're one of the first people I see that's kind of mixing the two, where you can go down a river in your boat and you can also cross, cross open water, and it kind of reminded me of the way in the old days, you know, the Viking longships could do this and, and uh, probably a lot of other b boats uh, previously, but uh, you're kind of reviving this uh, method of, of travel, it seems like. Uh, do you want to just tell us maybe about your two main trips, the one that your book was based on, the the three years in a 12-foot boat, and then your, your more recent trip? Sure. Um, three years in a 12-foot boat, I have the book here, so I'll show you the book cover. <clears throat> yeah. It's a um, little boat that I designed and built. It's only 12 feet long. It's a rowboat with sails. It's very light. You can pull it up the beach by yourself. And um, so this I did in my late 30s. And uh, I sailed for three years. I, I went. Um, it also was rivers and coastlines. So I did a lot of um, river traveling in the U.S. And then um, I sailed by various salt waters to South America and then um, crossing of the Andes that's some portaging some pickup truck rides and stuff and then down in that case it was the Orinoco to get across South America from west to east so I'm back to the Atlantic side and then I sailed from the mouth of the Orinoco to Florida <coughs> by means of the Caribbean islands so that was the voyage that that occurred in 1990 to 1993 um, and then the more recent one was that um, this was with my wife I I married a woman who's um, really adventurous and so we took off on a trip that after a couple years congealed as to what it was going to be and that's that it was a voyage sort of similar but at a little bit larger scale with a little bit larger boat instead of a 12 foot boat it was a 21 foot boat Instead of being gone for three years, we were gone for five years, and um, able to just generally go a little bit further. For for about two thirds of this voyage, um, we had a little two horsepower motor, which obviously expanded our ability to <clears throat> make miles in any particular day. But it, some of the some of the ground was the same as from my first voyage, in that some of it was like on the Orinoco River, and some was in the Caribbean. But uh, a lot of it was down in um, in South America itself once we got to um, the Venezuelan coast and we started going into the rivers of South America we spent the last oh about like the middle year and a couple years just on the rivers of South America we went all the way to Argentina so uh, but similar similar voyage except that obviously I was with somebody else and then my son our son was born along the way he was born in Brazil so it was a family thing but other than that sort of similar to the first voyage um, Can you tell, you, us, tell us how did it all start? How did you start all this adventurous uh, lifestyle? Like you had a regular life out before and you decided to, I'm going to travel now, I'm going to do a sell, selling lifestyle, or how did it all start? Well, um, the, the part that is <clears throat> of my life that has not been so normal is that I've done a lot of outdoor things like um, cross-country skiing is probably the biggest one. Um, a lot of <clears throat> sometimes semi-technical trips into the, the backpacking wilderness of Washington State. And then other trips like, um, oh, some bicycling and canoeing and stuff. Just a, just a variety of smaller things, but a lot of, a lot of outdoors, a lot of outdoor experiences always, you know. And then I had traveled a little bit too. I had traveled in Europe once before this. Before this, um, I guess I'd traveled there twice before the voyage uh, that was for three years. But mostly it was um, uh, a way to travel. Well, the, the idea is uh, to be able to travel for a long period of time and really get into it, you know, to, to, to really spend some years traveling and, and being close to nature and with a lot of always crossing new new borders of new countries and stuff traveling plus being really close to a lot of uh, ecologically 
pristine places. And I saw in your blog you calculated at one point on this most recent trip it was only costing you and your wife seventeen thousand dollars one 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 entire year. I think mm -hmm. you mentioned. That sounds about right. And I I guess the earlier trip in the nineties was even cheaper. That was very cheap. I think it was two thousand five hundred dollars per year, or something like that. Wow. Um, <laughs> of course, that's partly inflation and so forth. And how did you get uh, the, your first boat uh, to the coast in Panama? I think you you put it on a on a transport ship, and, and did you do the same with with your second uh, trip to no. get down to South America? In um, that's nineteen nineteen ninety, I I went I went across North America by the rivers, came out at the mouth of the Mississippi River, and um, I got a temporary job on a freighter in which I brought my boat along as my personal baggage. <laughs> so it was a Norwegian flagged um, carrier, bulk carrier, and uh, they just dropped me off in Panama. So that's how I got from from Louisiana to, to um, Central America that time. And then um, in the later voyage, we, we sailed all the way. We, we bought the boat in Florida and we sailed from Florida. So we sailed to the Bahamas, Cuba, Mexico, followed the coastline of Central America, and just continuously following the coast. That's how we got there the second time. I imagine one of the more difficult things, especially with your first boat, was on the Pacific coast when you were trying to come into the beaches at night. I, uh, normally, I guess you would come into the beach to sleep at night on the Pacific coast of Colombia, for example. How did you get in through the surf? Were you just able to find beaches that you could get into, or or what? Yeah, the the Pacific coast of Colombia has big surf, and um, I was only able to come in through it. You know, when there's some sort of harbor, and sometimes there was, and sometimes there wasn't, some something to give you, you know, an angle, a, a protected a protected zone where where, the, where where beaches and being hit by the surf. Yeah, that was um, that made it difficult. Also, the um, the tidal fluctuations are high there. Traveling in a small boat is very difficult when you have high tidal range, because all everything else is exacerbated. Like the the difficulty of surf is exacerbated when you have high tidal range, and especially if you have tidal range, high tidal range, and gradual runout. That means that the shoreline is shifting towards the land when the tide is high and, and out to sea when tide is low and wherever it is at any point in time there's a big surf. So yeah, th that does complicate it. What did you, were you always able to find a place to sleep at night then on those beaches or sometimes you had to sleep on the boat anchored or, or what? Um, a little bit of everything. Uh, there was nights to sleep at anchor and a night to sleep at uh, floating, just drifting. And um, but probably at least half the time I was able to pull out onto onto a beach. Yeah. In that in that in that occasion, the uh, coming down the Pacific coast of of Colombia, I actually spent most of the time holed up in certain little towns because I was always getting so far and then having some sort of problem, some sort of skin infection or capsize or something. So I ended up staying here and there for periods of time and then I would get out there and make some more headway. But that's a really beautiful coastline but also very, uh, at least at then, very relatively untouched, like no travelers go there. It's real. It's considered to be, it was considered to be too dangerous. It's now, it's now more on the cruising route. There actually is a cruising guide for that coastline now. But it's still not recommended to go every place. <laughs> There's piracy that's associated with drug running you know, routes. And uh, since you traveled in rivers and on coastlines uh, a lot, what were some of your best experiences, both in the rivers versus the open ocean uh, sailing, and, and what were some of the biggest challenges or uh, unexpected things in, in both cases? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, the rivers are really, really sweet. They're really... A pleasure to, to travel on the rivers. The rivers are so 
easy in comparison to the open sea. You always have um, protected waters, almost always, and um, so it's always easy to just sleep for the night and um, provisioning is easier because you can provision it at a town when you get to it. Um, wildlife viewing is very good on rivers and um, in South America the, the rivers um, they are very well laid out. You can go to you can go to almost every country in South America by river if you want to and so you, you get a lot of a lot of variety. You can go a lot of places. It's it's got its um, difficulties in terms of transporting. Our, our boat, 21 feet long, um, five feet wide, and weighed with most of the stuff still inside it, weighed maybe 1,200 pounds. Was moderately challenging to get portages, but we always worked something out. I think we did something like 13 portages in total, from as short as mm, like a quarter mile to as long as 500 miles and some of those we had to pay for up to I think the biggest one was five hundred dollars and uh, many of them most half of them were free so these are around um, rapids around dams and in about um, three occasions I think three occasions they're from where they're from one watershed to another, where you go as far as you can and typically up one river until you're at an extremity of that watershed, and then that's a portage in the more you know, classic sense, where you're being portaged to where a river begins on the other side of the divide. So those are the challenges there. Just you know, it was the like logistics of making those rides happen, which wasn't too bad, um, and so all in all. All in all, the rivers were much easier. In the coastlines, we had difficult stretches. Um, you have you have places in the world where there's no there's no harbors, there's no beaches you can pull out onto. You have long stretches where you have to stay at sea. And um, in neither of my cases was was the boat something you really should that you really want to sleep aboard. They're so light. They, they bob like a cork and uh, you don't get a good night's sleep. So sleeping aboard on the boat is only something you do because you absolutely have to. In some cases you're, you'll be making a, a passage from one place to another where if, if your passage is um, 80 miles or less, you might be able to do it in a day or you might be able to start two hours before dawn but get there before sundown. You know, when you when you when you conclude when you make a landfall, you should do it in daylight, and so you have to get up early enough the night. You have to start early enough the night before to get there um, before dark of the day you plan to get there. But in other cases, it makes more sense to just go out and make um, progress during the day, take down the sails and drift at night, and then finish the next day. So, yeah, some of the difficult stretches were off the coast of Honduras. That was before we got a motor and was against the, the wind and current. But then coming out of the mouth of the Amazon was really challenging. The, the Amazon basin generally is, is really beautiful. It's probably our favorite place. But um, that was just a very uh, concentrated difficulty there, coming out the mouth of the Amazon River. Um, the big challenges are that there's a lot of current it's current. It's tight. It's um tidal current. It's not really river current. So it goes one way and then it goes the other way. But typically three knots, and the distances are great. You'll be trying to make some progress through some region of low islands and shallow water with high tidal current. But then you don't get where you're trying to go, and um, they actually have um, true tidal waves there. Waves that are like tidal waves, but caused by the tide. And uh, not the time of year I was there, but it was one of the things I had to verify that none of those were going to hit me along the way. <laughs> yeah, and so very hot. Mm -hmm. And when you do get to land, it's typically low, very soft mud that you can't walk in. You know? mm -hmm. So, and then really bad bugs. So it has its challenges. That's that's the mouth of the Amazon River area, and the um, the Guyanas, which are north and west of that.
I was going to ask you about the bugs also on, on the rivers. Uh, did you have a way of enclosing the boat somehow to keep out most of the bugs, or you just slept in a, a tent uh, on shore at night, or, or how did you deal with the bugs? Yeah, the, the cabin, the 21-footer the, the has a cabin with a mosquito net, also uh, a no net that's got a finer, finer uh, mesh. And, um, but it's hot at night. Sometimes it's too hot even for one person to want to stay in the cabin, and there's two or three people packing into a very small space. It's too hot. So I also put a, um, a mesh that sort of suspends over me when I'm sitting in the co cockpit. So my wife and later on the baby would be in the cabin, but I would sleep in the cockpit just because that way we have less heat you build up in the cabin. <clears throat> That's Netting is probably the number one protection. Uh, you, you can use um, insect coils and um, insect repellent and full clothing and stuff like that too. Yeah, what mosquitoes were, and the different kinds of noceums are, are both a big problem. What were some of the more dangerous moments on, on either trip that you didn't really expect? And if you could uh, you know, re redo the design of the boat, I, th I think I've seen you were asked this question in the past, if you could uh, kind of redesign the boats in, in any way or, or maybe do something differently, uh, can you think of any particular issues? Mm -hmm. Well, the... The, what you have to decide is if you're going to want to be able to pull the boat out. It's nice to be able to get out of the water. First, the, my first boat was small enough to do that. The second boat really wasn't, and so you're kind of you have less less options in some cases because you you have to stay in the water. But on the other hand, if you had a bigger boat, you'd have more options in some other ways, but you wouldn't have them in the first way. Like if you have a somewhat bigger boat, it'd be more comfortable to sleep aboard. But then you'd, I think any larger and heavier than, than what we had, I wouldn't want to have to do all those portages. So I wouldn't recommend a bigger boat if you're going to go all over South America and the rivers. Um, one thing that I really had a lot of, um, uh, well, thought about was that I'd like to have a boat that was quicker through the water because when you're on the rivers, it comes to mind on the rivers, it's, it, it applies anywhere, but it really came to mind on the rivers is that you spend so long with just say a small outboard motor or something, or you might, or rowing, but either way you want to slip through the water as efficiently as possible, so I, and any displacement boat, you know, standard hull shape will have uh, a drag associated with it and a, and a maximum hull speed that's a pretty low number, whereas if you had a um, multi-hull or just a longer skinnier hull of some sort, then you can um, go faster and sort of escape the hull speed. Sometimes when you're, sometimes on the rivers you'll get to places where there's um, higher current and if you have only a little little boat and a kind of a little motor and kind of a standard boat, you may not be able to beat the current. But if you have a faster boat able to slip through the water better, then, then you can get ahead, uh, you, can, you have less to worry about as to whether you're going to be able to get past a, a rapids. Going up river is, is obviously more challenging than coming down the rivers. Coming down the rivers is just so fun and kind of easy, but going upstream you have to, you have to always be able to exceed this, the, the velocity of the current, you know, in every, in every bend of the river. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about getting a, um, having a, a multi-haul for my next voyage. Steve, what percentage of the year do you spend on uh, boat uh, in the past years and now? I mean, you most of the year you're you're on a boat, or you spend also part of the year on the land. Oh, uh, there really, I only do this. I I really only sail and so forth during these two big voyages. Um, during the voyages, they they're full time, and uh, otherwise, I'm do, I'm doing other things, but. Um, Full time, except that obviously during the course of this voyage, the three the three year voyage and the five year voyage. I mean, obviously you're on land a lot of the time. If that's what you mean by your question, there's a lot of reason to be on land at different times, and um, we we stay as long as a month in one place or two months in another place. You know that happens too. There's different reasons why you you have to stop. Like <clears throat> when we got to Manaus, the big city in the Amazon basin, we. We had to wait there about six weeks just to receive a package. 
because we needed some parts, you know. So that's just an example of how you have to stay in one place sometimes longer than you expect to. How was it after your first trip, uh, and, and maybe after this trip too, to return to normal life? Uh, w what did you do after each trip uh, for, I guess it was 15 years or so between your, your first trip and your second? Mm -hmm. um, I just went back to my career working as a city planner, urban type planning for small towns in, in the state of Washington. Since getting back from the um, recent trip, I have not yet found a job in my field. I'm living at my mother's house. She's she she's old enough now that it's better that somebody stay with her anyway. So we're living at my the house that I grew up in, and not sure when I'll be able to go on another adventure. Was it kind of a difficult transition from you know doing an amazing adventure to returning to regular life, or is it something you've done several times anyway? So. Oh, a, um, when when you go on an adventure you are probably really really anxious to travel and you have a lot of wanderlust and um, so it's very very moving experience to be able to begin a voyage and then um, you're satisfying that wanderlust and then eventually the theory at least it, it applied in some cases to some extent in both of these cases your wanderlust gets uh, satisfied after a while, believe it or not, you know you, you it, be, it just it becomes everyday life. But then um, you're kind of ready eventually. I mean, after a long time to to be just at home again for a while. So it's it's not been a difficult transition to come back, except that I'd say in a different sense, you um, you're you're go you're gone from home for so long that um, you really do have to kind of make new friends and stuff, you know. Um, you have to find a new job probably and you might be living in a different town and uh, whoever your friends were they may have moved on and stuff. So it's a, dis it's a disjunct in your life. Are you planning to write a book about your second uh, uh, trip or, or, or no? Not really. Um, the, we feel the book has been written because it's been published in the Small Craft Advisor magazine, and um, for five years, it's, that's a that magazine comes out every two months. But for the whole length of the time, they always had our article in it, and everything was everything is there. Um, it's about what would have appeared in a book, so um, I feel I feel that's been satisfied. Like I said, it really was an, an interesting uh, kind of revival of, of the way I imagine uh, a lot of small craft operated in, in the old days to, to be able to go up rivers and, and along the coast. Do you know many other people who have, have done this? It, to me, it seems like you're kind of a pioneer in, in this particular niche. Uh, I believe we are. We, um, well, as we're traveling, of course, we hear about other people that have done anything at all similar, they'll if if anybody has done anything at all similar, and in people's memory they will tell you. And um, we were told along one stretch about somebody who had traveled through there in a in a kayak a couple of years before. And um, really interesting was that on on the perhaps most odd connection. Um, of waterways that we made, which is from the upper Orinoco to the upper Rio Negro, which is part of the Amazon. I only knew about that because of a book I'd read a long time ago called Paddle to the Amazon. And that that is a book in which a father and son team canoeing went up the Orinoco, found this connection between the Orinoco and the Rio Negro, made the connection and went down. and. Um, so it's just oddball thing because normally when you go up a river, you you go up until you have to stop. But in this case, there is a connection with a whole other river basin. Then you can go downstream in it. And um, we talked to a guy there that had, uh, although this was a long time before, this was like 30, maybe more than 30 years before, there was a vague memory of that of that father and son team who had gone through there in, I believe, the year 1980. So mm -hmm. most, mem most memory fades after a few years, but there's one guy that remembered 
that that earlier team, it was which is really a fantastic voyage. If you haven't read it, it's Paddle to the Amazon. How did you uh, you know, find food? Did did you fish for yourself part of the time, or usually you were you know running in villages and places that you would buy food, or how did that work on both voyages? The latter, almost no fishing, just just purchasing provisions of any sort where you can find them. I'm not asking you, of course, a, a detail of your finances, Steve, but I wanted to ask, how did you finance your, your long trips? This uh, long trip that you had in the past, for example, did you go with your savings or... Because, you know, there are a lot of people who fantasize about, you know, like, uh, uh, doing adventures and uh, staying away from uh, the regular lifestyle, but they always think like it's impossible because you can't, it's too expensive, you can't leave your job, your regular job. Uh, what was your experience? You found that it was more cheap than most people think, or you went with your savings, you were lucky, you, find, you found another way. What would you tell to these people? Um, I always had um, pretty good ability to, to save. I, my, my jobs have paid just sort of average, but I, I, my, my daily lifestyle is on a lower level, so I've, I've got a high savings rate whenever I have a real job, and so it's just savings. And I never, I've never had to work during one of my travels. I, I just went on savings. What are some of your best memories from the two trips? Best memories? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's see. The the three years in a 12-foot boat. Oh, probably some of the, the islands in the Caribbean. They're so beautiful. And being able to sail from one island to the next. Um, it's always um, kind of scary if you can't see the next island to get in a small island and sail uh, and maybe overnight to get there. But they're they're beautiful islands, you know, they're so gorgeous. And then um, the more recent one, I guess, yeah, the especially for my wife, she she loves the um, the Amazon basin as I do as I do too, and especially the the Rio Negro, which is a you know the the, the Amazon has all these tributaries, and many of those tributaries are so big that they're the second, third, and fourth biggest rivers in the world. You know, any of them just by themselves is still bigger than the Mississippi or the Nile. That just goes to show how big they all are. And um, there's a lot of just wilderness where you can go literally days at a time without seeing anybody. It's just vast, vast um, landscape. It's We were traveling a lot of the time on the Rio Negro when the rivers are high and the land is all partly flooded, so it's... Um, it's often big enough so where you can't see a horizon someplace or other. You know, it's got a sea horizon built into it in places. And the, the forests are partly indebted. The, the, the shoreline is not a beach. The shoreline is just um, fading into forest. So you can actually navigate through trees sometimes, uh, go through what maybe is clearings, and you don't know what's underneath you, but you've got trees poking up here and there all around you as you proceed a lot of the time that's that's the case and it's a really big um, monumental landscape features like um, I'm thinking of the Rio Negro it's largely a fat flat land but it has rising they're like um, typical is a big um, extrusion of rock so it's a big hard solid rock thing that's maybe a big kind of a hemispherical shape that's very big in scale like a thousand feet tall or something in it or a pinnacle looking thing or a sugar loaf thing, looking thing that's kind of rising up here but other, but other than that everything's flat and then you get another one that's sticking up over there and then although the general rule is that the rivers are fairly benign they do um, move quicker in, in other places and they have big areas of um, not exact well in some cases you'd have to call them rapids in other cases just um, not quite rapids but more interesting you know where the whole thing picks up in speed and it 
it's not just one monolithic river. It's dividing up into channels and uh, dropping off over low ledges. And uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. Then you come to new towns and so forth. And they're all, though the towns are very isolated from each other, they're, they're um, perhaps hundreds of miles from the nearest place where there is any, any streets or roads. And they're not connected by streets or roads to those other places. But there are, there are, cars there because they brought them in by boat. So each each town is really an island of urbanization and you can only get there by um, by boat or by an airstrip. Yeah, a lot of really remote places and yet when you are in those places, um, some town in remote part of Venezuela or or Brazil, they they're actually a sort of normal little town maybe too, it, but it's just it's just isolated piece of, you know, life. There. Yeah. Is there any particular advice you'd give to other people who might be considering this in the future, a, a, a similar journey in a similar boat? Um, I guess one one precaution is that the the legal aspect of it and the financial and the permit processing aspect of it is is pretty challenging. My wife was really good at it. And so we, we had very little problems, but it is pretty extensive what you have to do. You have to, um, you have to figure so many things out in, in, in order not to get in trouble with the, the different types of uh, permits and um, visas. And, and in some cases, the countries are difficult because they have, especially the ones that have socialist governments, um, because Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Argentina are the most socialist of the countries we went to, and they were the ones that were the most difficult for us to deal with. They tend to not have free market money systems. They are controlled currencies, and um, they can be very expensive if you don't go use the black market, but you have to be careful when you use the black market and um, things like that. Watch out for different kinds of bribery, more corruption. One uh, one other question. Uh, Paulo is going to be in Morocco next uh, month, and I hear you uh, you had an interesting experience in Morocco uh, many years ago before you did any of these uh, trips. Do, do you have an, any advice for Paulo, <laughs> or or want to talk about your experiences in Morocco? Oh well, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I I got into a motorcycle accident and ended up in um, the prison in. Tetuan and then in um, Tangier. So, um, oh, he probably he probably won't be doing what I did. <laughs> um, and I don't know if it's particularly dangerous there still. But uh, yeah, the the prison in, in Tangier is not a fun place. But I don't expect you to end up there. Let's open up. <laughs> don't smuggle drugs. <laughs> I I will try not to. I wanted to ask you, uh, selling aside. Uh, what would you say are the most important uh, things that you learned d during your life that would feel like, uh, uh, you know, giving advice to someone that you really love? Like, for example, you, what are the things that you feel you learned during your life that are the more, most important things that you learned about life in general? Hmm. Well, um, maybe it's to, and this is just a, a technical answer, but to reduce your uh, your equipment and your tools to the bare bones and to, to know know how to fix things and have just the right amount, just have the right tools and don't have any extra tools. Um, that's and keeping taking good care of the things that you have. You when you're traveling like this, you don't have an extra of anything typically or maybe you can carry an extra or something but it's so difficult to ever ever get anything replaced you like an outboard motor I don't care where you are in the world if you wherever you are in the world you probably they probably don't sell the kind of outboard motor you have so you can't get parts for your outboard motor so you have to learn how to use an outboard motor and maintain it and um, you know you have to be able to rebuild a little motor which did not come easily to me. I wasn't particularly mechanically inclined, but I I managed to to do it on several occasions, breaking down a 
a little outboard motor and putting it back together again. And, and just wherever you end up, you know, it might be on a beach someplace. And is there any adventure that you that you still haven't done, or any dream that you haven't accomplished yet that you would like to in the future? We have one big major dream, which I really don't know if we'll ever achieve it. I should probably say not because it doesn't seem likely. But um, I would like to. As some places I'd like to go you know, by boat are the Great Lakes, and also. Um, I'd like to go to the Azores, and I'd like to go to Europe. I'd like to go to the Mediterranean. I'd like to go to West Africa. I'd like to sail from West Africa to, to Brazil. So that I'd like for us to be able to return to Brazil. Our son is born there. And um, there are some, some places I like. I, we, we, I, we meant to sail the Bahamas. From, from one end to the other, we never managed to do that. So in this big voyage I'm talking about, it includes, actually one voyage could include all those places I've mentioned because they're on a kind of a track. If it could end up with sailing through the Bahamas to get back to the United States, that'd be a pretty good voyage. But I, I don't know if I'll be able to do that. We're going to have another child now. So I don't know when it'll happen. Well, I didn't realize you were having another child. Did you have any other questions, Paulo? Or um, uh, no, no, so, so you're, I'm fine. Uh, so, Steve, your your one book is uh, three years in a twelve foot boat. Uh, that's still for sale on Amazon. And uh, what was the magazine where you said your articles about the second uh, or the the outlet where your articles about the second trip were available? It's called the Small Craft Advisor, okay. and they they do have electronic subscriptions. Well, it was a really adv interesting adventure, and like I said, uh, I think to me, when, I, when once I was reading it, I realized why I was so interested because you know, nobody else really seems to be doing this, combining what you can do with a kayak with what you can do with a, an offshore uh, cruising boat, and uh, it seems like the best way maybe to cover the most ground in, in many many areas. Yeah, yeah, it all depends on the shoreline. There's There's places where the shoreline is mangrove swamp, and in a really small boat, you can pull right in to you in between the trees, you know, in the mangrove sometimes. So, just an example. Or if there's um, certain certain size of a river mouth, you might be able to get into with a really small boat that you couldn't get into with a, in a bigger boat. But then just the opposite too. There's there's river mouths that you could get into with a bigger boat because they're able to handle bigger bigger breakers. In a smaller boat, you couldn't handle it. So everything is just very site specific. Mm -hmm. Every every situation, every place is different. There's a lot of our, our variability. I, I I did so much. I had traveled so much in Central and South America by boat that I thought I'd probably seen just about everything. But when I, the towards the end of that last voyage, I sailed through the Guyanas, and that's a totally different situation than than I had ran into before where they have such extreme tidal run out and everything is so soft, su such soft mud and you can't get close to land except at high tide and then it's thin mud with really bad bugs and extreme heat. So that was just a different situation. You find a lot of, a lot of different situations. Well, it was really interesting to, to hear about it in person and um, I'm glad we could record it online for, for people in the future to, to learn about. Uh, thank, thank you for being here with us today. All right, thank you. Nice to meet thank you, Paul. Thank you for Paul. spending some time with us. Thank you. Okay. Take care.